So uh, if you have uh, seen the, pro uh, the program, I think it says brain and emotion, but actually I'm going to speak about uh, virtual reality for consciousness. And uh, well, I would like to tell you that I, I first experienced uh, virtual, immersive virtual reality in 2001. And by that, by that time I was a neuroscientist studying how the brain processes visual information. And from the moment I experienced immersive virtual reality, I realized it was an amazing tool in order to study how the brain processes information and to study perception. And uh, soon after, I started, along with Mel Slater, who spoke earlier, uh, we started actually a European project where we brought together neuroscientists and computer scientists, and where we proposed crazy things at the moment, like we would do navigation in virtual reality through brain waves. And actually, it was something achieved during the course of the project. And, and then, uh, since then, I have uh, used virtual reality to carry out experiments that are always inspired on uh, the study of brain function. We not always measure brain function, but they are always inspired by neuroscientific uh, questions. So there is an ultimate goal, in, not only for neuroscience or for philosophers, but I think for all of us as humans, which is to, to understand or to try to understand what is consciousness and what is uh, the self, like uh, where is the self, is it just the, gen the, the product of, of uh, brain function, or where is it located, what are the neural correlates and, uh, of consciousness and so on. And what I want to claim and my message during this talk is that virtual reality is, is a unique tool in order to study uh, experimentally, to study consciousness, to study uh, self-consciousness. And, and I will just give you during this talk some examples about this. So, so uh, self-consciousness is being said to have uh, three layers. One is that we have an internal representation of the world. Uh, second, we have an internal representation of the body, and then we have an autobiographical nature. We have a sense of unity that unites the past, the present, of, and the future of what is the self. So I won't talk today about the internal representation of the world, but in 2005, Mel Slater and I, we wrote uh, a paper, sorry, in uh, Nature Reviews Neuroscience that we call From Presence to Consciousness Through Virtual Reality, where we concentrated uh, on, on, the ex extern on the internal representation of the world and how it can be studied through the use of virtual reality, basically because it allows us to very well study perception, multisensory integration, how much of the information that we process from the external world comes from the outside and how much of it is internally generated and so on. So this is uh, dealt in this study. And today we'll concentrate extremely on, on this area of cell consciousness, which is the internal representation of the body. So obviously the perception of our own body is fundamental, it's a fundamental aspect of how we experience ourselves. So even when we all have this illusion that there is this self that is somehow somewhere separated from our body, actually our body is very critical to develop the self. And, and uh, since we are uh, babies, the consciousness of who we are is very determined by our body, by how much we can influence the world and how much we can reach. This is how, where we are, what is the self. Or in other words, our conscious perceptual experiences are experiences of the world having an impact on our bodies and our bodies having an impact in the world. So there is an experiment. Uh, so there is, if I ask you now, so how do you know what is your body? You will say, I'm, or how do you know that the chair you are sitting on is not part of your body? You will say, well, it's obvious, you know, I touch the chair and I don't feel it. However, I move my hand and I see it moving, so I know it's my body. And, and this is uh, actually the result of what uh, it's been referred to today as multisensory integration. And it's something that be, uh, body illusions uh, have been very helpful to understand how this sense of the body uh, is generated. It's been mentioned today and very nicely illustrated. I had a movie about this, but because Andrea Serino sh uh, showed it, I won't show a, um, a movie 
about uh, how is the a rubber hand illusion, but it's a very nice example of how it would provide visual and tactile synchronous information. We can induce this illusion that a rubber arm is actually part of our own body. And this can be done with other parts of the body. For example, this is an illusion which is called um, a Pinocchio illusion, where if we provide visual tactile a stimulation in this nose and the nose in front, there is this illusion generated that our nose is very long one. And this, and this illusion completely is abolished the moment that the stimulation is asynchronous. So this is a very nice illustration of how plastic our conception of our own body is. It can be transformed in a, in a few seconds. And this is something that we are going to be able uh, to exploit. And you've seen some examples in virtual reality. We can exploit this plasticity of how our internal body representation is. So uh, some years ago, we reproduced this, along with Daniel, who is also here today, in virtual reality. And we demonstrated that Actually, this rubber arm illusion can be very well reproduced. Oh, we have a bird now. <laughs> uh, this can be reproduced in virtual reality. And uh, here you can see the reproduction in virtual reality of this rubber arm illusion. So you can see how we provide, um, <coughs> we provide a, a tactile stimulation in the hand and the visual information comes from a virtual hand which for the point of view of the subject comes out of their own shoulder. And when this is done synchronously, what we demonstrated was that the illusion of ownership of this uh, virtual arm was the same as with the rubber arm. And this doesn't happen when the uh, uh, visual and the tactile information is asynchronous. So basically, if we measure, if we ask the subject, or if we measure different aspects that I won't go into details, like if we measure the electrical activity of the muscle or the proprioceptive displacement, we can actually verify that there is an illusion that this virtual arm is part of the body. And uh, we can measure it in, in different ways. So basically we saw it's the same. We can make the virtual body or the virtual arm feel as own. Some years later, we also showed that actually this is the case with uh, visual motor correlations. We don't, not don't need to have tactile information. Sorry that the video went. But you can see here, oh, no, actually it doesn't come in the projection. But what we have is a glove, and there is movement of the hand. And then this movement is transmitted to the virtual hand that moves correlated or uncorrelated, as you can see here. And again, we saw that the illusion is the same. It's as strong. If we, if we provide visual tactile correlations or if we provide visual motor correlations. So we moved on to do this, but for the whole body. So this is a full body illusion that we can induce, as Mel has shown some examples, but here you see more the building of it. And you can see how the body is struck. The person sees the body from a first person point of view and also sees the body reflected in a mirror, and here is the first person point of view, and therefore there is this uh, feeling that this body, because it moves when I move, uh, then it's, it must be my body. I, I feel this illusion of ownership. So I, I told you I was going to talk about self-consciousness, and now I will give you five points of examples of how this influence, uh, how is this influence of this virtual body on ourselves are what it tells us about the self. So the first point I will make is that the internal representation of the body is very plastic. And we have seen also, we, I already illustrated that with this body transformation illusions, but we have done more. And this is why virtual reality is very useful for, for these kind of studies. We can do things we would never do in the real world. And as Mel was saying, this is the interest of using virtual reality to do things that are different from what we actually can achieve in the, in the real world. Like for example, in this study, I won't show any video not to take longer time, 
but we show that we can pro uh, still have ownership over a virtual arm, even if this arm is four times longer than our real arm. And when it becomes longer, as far as there is a uh, correct visual tactile correlations and visual motor correlations, the illusion exists even if we, our body gets transformed, like for example, elongated and asymmetric, which is another point here. So therefore, there is this plasticity that we can see in many different ways. This is from another study where there was an internalization of the body of a child. And uh, maybe I'll show you just a little bit of the video. So in this experiment, there was two conditions. One, where the, the subjects went in the body of a child and another one, they went in the body of a small human of the same size. And we saw here what you can see, how the body, this is the body of a child. It has this more roundish shape. The person sees the body reflected in the mirror. Mom comes in. It's a bigger body. We see the body from the perspective of a child. And the one below is the experiment where the person is embodied in a very uh, tiny human. And, um, and then there is this plasticity to feel this body uh, as own. And the very interesting thing is that this has an impact on ourselves. And in this case, a very obvious impact is that there is a recalibration of the size of things. So when, when the calibration of different objects in the virtual reality is done, the people that have been embodied in this child body, they see things, they calibrate things as bigger. And this is a very interesting measurable consequence of having this smaller body. Therefore, the body that we can feel as own in virtual reality has this impact. Second point, I'll go very fast, Bruno. <laughs> so the second one is that our body has an impact in ourselves, and I, I don't need to take long time because Mel showed a very nice video about this. So we can therefore feel as own a black body, and this is going to have an impact on the implicit racial bias, there is now four experiments published with the results, or our body is going to determine to some extent our attitude. And, um, and this, I will show very briefly a video where three types of body were, uh, were uh, used. I don't know if this should have sound, but it's not critical. Uh, so what we did was to teach to play the drums to people and we gave them uh, different bodies to different groups. One was a white body, very formally dressed with a tie and a suit and so on. Another was uh, a more informal uh, body and another one was a no body, just some gloves. And uh, what we saw, and we had another very measurable parameter, we saw that people play the drums differently according that to the body that they are embodied in. So if people are embodied in a very formal body, they do a smaller movement. Since they are embodied in a body that they associate more to be playing the drums, they do larger movements. And the dimensionality of these movements can be measured. So therefore, in virtual reality, we can measure that our virtual body determines our attitudes or our behaviors. And even something as basic as pain we have seen that, uh, for example, changing the skin color, like you can see here, the arm with different colors, we have seen that a red looking arm is going to have a lower pain threshold. So the color of the skin has an impact and we have also seen that making a body progressively more transparent has a direct impact on how the pain threshold, where the pain threshold is. So not only changes attitudes and behaviors, uh, but also, um, also it can change something as basic as, as how we perceive pain. Uh, another, uh, just <laughs> I will mention very briefly, we can feel even agency for actions that we don't do. And uh, agency is the experience that we control our own actions. So we move our body, we have an effect in the world, and uh, we have shown that 
We can even, in virtual reality, we can experience agency even for actions that we haven't done if our embodied virtual body does them. For example, in this article uh, that uh, I don't have time to go into it, but uh, here is the reference. We show how people feel they spoke uh, with, uh, with uh, spoke words that they didn't speak, but their virtual body did, and they have a, a correlation of a tactile stimulation here. And also, uh, we can, of course, our interest is from the neuroscience, so we can, uh, if we do EEG or if we do brain studies, we can identify what is the brain signature associated, for example, in this case, to when we commit errors or when our virtual body makes errors, we can see how they have different brain signatures. And um, we can do, again, things that we don't do in the real world, like we can leave our own body. So we can have an out-of-the-body experience, experience without having a brain damage, which is good because normally out-of-the-body experiences are evoked when people have some kind of uh, some uh, special activity in the brain and uh, we can give this experience and see what it is and see how it is when the center of our own self is away from our bo body. And we can do this again in virtual reality. We can get people, leave their bodies and have a perspective of their own self from the ceiling, for example, and, and while still controlled their body sitting there or when they still feel visotactile stimulation from that body or not. So it allows thing, all these things that we cannot do in the real world and it gives us cues about uh, how is this self-consciousness built. And finally, uh, we can be someone else and Mel has illustrated this on how we can, for example, give different advice if we embody another person or if we see our own self from another perspective from outside. So um, I, with this I finish, I wanted to give you these examples of how virtual reality can be a very unique tool to study how, is the, how are these building blocks of self-consciousness and this is work that has been done in, in the Event Lab, Experimental Virtual Environment in, in Neuroscience and Technology in Barcelona and now in our spin-off, Virtual Body Works, and there is many, many people involved in these studies. Thanks very much.